Recovering from knee surgery is highly variable. It was going to take forever to get better if I was ever going to get better. There's got to be something out there besides a CPM machine, which and clearly isn't helping me. Active and aggressive with this thing, or I was going to. Need you know, I'm a guy that's not vision. looking to relieve the pain. I'm a guy that's looking to get back in the game. That downtime was not what I wanted. We've spent the last seven years perfecting the recovery system that takes variability out of knee rehab so you can quickly get back to your life. Welcome to The Bee's Knees, a podcast full of articles, interviews, clinical studies, and advice about knee surgery, physical therapy, and life after knee surgery. My name is PJ Ewing, and we are here on a yet another interview of a recent knee surgery patient. Um, we have David Sheehan with us today from Oklahoma. Exciting to have you here. Uh, I'm in New York. Uh, you are in Tulsa, is that right? Yeah, Tulsa, Oklahoma. All right. And we're going to chat a little bit about David's experience, both leading up to knee surgery, why he went through it, as well as what happened afterwards in recovery. And then we'll also dive into this sort of compromising, as I, at least I think about it, factor, which is neuropathy and how that affected the decisions that you made and how it's affected your recovery and, and those things. Um, so I'm, I'm, thank you for coming to this. Uh, I really appreciate it. There's no benefit for you other than, I think, helping the next patients out there, which is uh, admirable that you're doing this. So I appreciate it. Um, we didn't work together really directly. You worked with uh, one of our coaches. But before we get into that, why don't you, um, if you don't mind, David, tell us, um, I guess, just about yourself. This is that, uh, that you know, who are you kind of question. Okay. Well, i I'll, I'll be brief. I mean, I'm 72 years old, so I've done a lot of things in my life. But essentially, I, uh, I, I was a contractor all my life in a, in a family-held company. The company, unfortunately, uh, didn't survive a couple of years ago for, for a lot of reasons. But I worked probably almost 50 years in it. I was uh, generation number four. Uh, I grew up in Tulsa. I went to Notre Dame uh, in South Bend, Indiana for uh, about five and a half years. I got two degrees, a liberal arts degree and a civil engineering degree, and then a little bit of grad school. And then knew exactly, I mean, all through that, uh, probably wasn't the best student in the world because I knew eventually I was going to go to work in a family company. So I did that and uh, successfully for a lot of years and had a lot of fun and, you know, really was my life. Uh, yeah, did a lot of work uh, for fun. I For a long time, I was a really, really good golfer. Um, played at Southern Hills Country Club in Tulsa and got down to maybe a four handicap. Uh, but eventually, my back told me it didn't like my golf swing. So uh, I still like to be active, so I, I took up another fun hobby. I Probably at age 56 or 7, I started racing cars and and then got into serious car racing. I ended up buying a Porsche uh, 2010 Turbo, converting it into a race car, was starting to get really good at it, uh, spent several years at the local track, started traveling around the country, and then one day uh, they always say, you know, when the race tires go bad, well, I did. And then when I tried to take a turn at 95 miles an hour, and it didn't turn anymore. So... I was a little, that was my only previous experience with surgery. I broke uh, a, a bone in my back, and then when it healed, I found that I had bone spurs. So anyway, I, I got through that. So I was a little, you know, the surgeries are surgeries. And uh, so when, when along came this knee problem, which uh, oh, happened about oh, six months ago, uh, my right knee started acting up, started hurting, you know, I tried a lot of things. I tried a knee brace. Uh, I tried uh, exercise. Uh, again, and I mean just good exercise with a therapist. I tried really hard to, to avoid surgery because I think if you've had surgery, you don't really want another one, um, especially at my age. Um, but anyway, it got to where I was having a lot of trouble, and, and I, I was on a cane anyway because I have a peripheral neuropathy that I discovered about. 15 years ago, uh, I went to Mayo's, and then the lucky, as the doctor told me, uh, and I actually saw the son of the guy that wrote the book on neuropathy, um, and he said, you're in the lucky 10%, we don't know why you have it. 
And then I just hmm. a little side story. I went back about five years later, and he said, well, I think it was hereditary. And I said, well, that's good. Both parents have died since then, so you can't disprove that theory. <laughs> but right. I really, I, they really don't know. It, it, you know, I was not diabetic back then. I'm probably even only now just borderline diabetic. Most people, that's how you get neuropathy, but they really don't know why I have mine. So over the years, balance became an issue, and, and so other exercises, walking, treadmill, stuff like that are a little problematic. And I always was a swimmer, so I went back to swimming, oh, four or five times, six times a week, at, you know, about an hour a day, not fast, but, but long distance. And, uh, you know, to compensate for the neuropathy and the lack of feeling in my feet, I used big fins and, and you know, like dive fins and paddles on my hand. And uh, anyway, that probably aggravated the knee, but Basically, I think what happened, I had arthritis in the knee, and um, it, it kept getting worse, and um, you know, I had a couple good guys I knew, the orthopedic guys, and I'd seen them, and he'd, he'd given me a, a steroid shot, and that didn't work at all, and then a, something he called a rooster crown, which I should know the medical term for that, but that's what he used. And that was um, I think good. it's, does this sound familiar, hyaluronic acid? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably what it was. So he gave me Bruce three of those, and you know that gave me temporary relief, and I mean less than a week. Um, wow. It got to where at least three days a week, uh, it felt like I had a saw blade in my knee, and and finally, uh, um, one of like I said, I know personally about three doctors in this one orthopedic service, and. Uh, this my my friend, a guy named Dr. David Hicks, said, "Well, look, I don't do knees, uh, and David did part of my back operation along with a neurosurgeon. But uh, he said, look, we got a really good guy here, Dr. David Nonweiler. Go see him. And so David's the one that uh, the Nonweiler's the one that gave me the shots and worked with me. And you know, he said, you know, sooner or later you're going to have to have surgery. And he told me that, you know, pretty much up front." Uh, mm-hmm. by looking at the x-rays. And so I, I went through this for a couple months and, and then finally did uh, agree to have the surgery about six weeks ago. So this, uh, so many questions, but what's a, well, not amazing to me, but just I think would be interesting is I just did an interview for this Bees Knees podcast later earlier in the week. And uh, those same, uh, you know, rooster comb, rooster crown shots, but that patient, Six, uh, sorry, three years, three years. That's how wow. much time it was. The relief was pronounced and wonderful. The second round of shots didn't work, interestingly enough. But um, in your case, I mean, it was nothing, a week, and that was all. Yeah, in between shots. Yeah, no, it it really didn't help at all. And I, you know, maybe I'd waited too long or trying to put it off because I, you know, I really don't like surgery and and, and uh, but. It was really affecting my lifestyle. I was going to have to be on probably a lot of pain pills and even that, you know, and I mean big stuff, uh, even that yeah. didn't last all day. So uh, I knew eventually. So I, I scheduled the surgery, and, and you know, I, I will give you sort of an advance. The day after the surgery, a non came in my uh, hospital room, I don't know how early in the morning, and I certainly probably wasn't very – coherent at that time but he is he's a man of few words uh, very good doctor but he not he doesn't talk a lot but so the the words are very poignant he said your knee was terrible mm. wow and it was so, six months before that you kind of said gee i better i better start thinking about knee surgery or had it been bothering you at all before then? Uh, no, that one, in fact, it's funny. My left knee bothered me a little bit, and I did a little while on a brace and some exercise. It went away. Um, although huh. my, my x-ray the other day, they looked at the left knee also, and yeah, it doesn't look very good either. But knock on wood, hopefully I can – I don't want to have another one of these for no. a while. But uh, no. uh, In fact, I probably have to get another wife. She doesn't like being a nurse too much. <laughs> Well, uh, that's beyond the scope of this podcast, David. Well, I know. I see. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, I, I I can talk a little bit. You know, we uh, they have a really good hospital. Uh, 
that the, that these orthopedic doctors actually own. And I think now there's several groups of doctors, but uh, went there, the, the, the surgery, I mean, I really, you know, they, they take you in the room and uh, when they did, a, I guess they did, a, I'll back up a little bit. They did a CAT scan about a week earlier. And PJ, you may not know the name of this, but it's that robotic arm thing. Um, uh, make the well, the the for the surgery they use makoplasty. That's the big yeah, process. Yeah, that, that's right? what it is. Because yeah. I found out later, I've got two screw holes in my shin where they attach the bottom of the arm to, to my leg, oh. <laughs> so it wouldn't move. They screwed it in there. But but anyway, uh, you know, I woke up. I guess it was, I want to guess, two or three hours and. Uh, you know, they did a they did a full nerve block. So, you know, I woke up. I mean, I don't even sure I had a leg, but mm. I was sort of lucky. I, I mean, I, I maybe this is where the neuropathy came in, but I'm going to tell you what, other than maybe a couple days right after the surgery and then maybe off and on for a week, I never had a lot of pain. Huh. Um, in fact, I told uh, the, the Dr. Nonweiler's assistant yesterday. I think I think I've had one pain pill in in four weeks, and and that was maybe more for my nerves were kicking me up. So I said, "Well, try one of these things and see if it helped." And eh, it, 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 my neurontin that I take does a, just as good a job. So or gabapentin, whatever you want to call it. So, but mm-hmm. anyway, you know. That, however, though, with all that said. Um, you know, I had a couple issues in the hospital that, that were non-related to the surgery. The surgery was fine. I think he did a fabulous job. Uh, but I had a reaction, I think, to the medicine or the nerve medicine. Uh, about two days later, my bladder stopped working, and so I had to have a catheter. Uh, and, and then it messed with my blood sugar a little bit. It bounced around for a week or so. So I scheduled, I knew I had a, a deal with you guys about, oh, 10 days after the surgery. Uh, and my wife had insisted because of my balance issues and me being a lot bigger that I go to a rehab place. And, and so I did that. But it took a couple of days to get in there. And then I got in there like on a Friday afternoon. And so I went like five days without therapy. So when wow. like, therapy kicked in at the rehab place, you know, I'm five days behind, and, and I'll, I'll just say this. If I had this to do over again, if I could solve, you know, if I didn't have the, the, the this blood sugar issue or didn't have the bladder issue, I'd figure out how to get somebody at home, and I'd try to schedule your machine right away because they did a good job at the therapy place, but it wasn't, you know, it was maximum of three hours a day, and their hours are pretty short hours, and some of them were group therapy deals that weren't really therapy. They were more therapy of the mind. So I was pretty motivated to do this. And once I got your machine, I, I took to that thing like a duck to water. And I I went at least three, four sessions a day at 40, 45-minute sessions with it. And I progressed tremendously, I think, once I got on your machine. That's really interesting. Uh, did you... I mean, I've heard, I've never attended a group sessions, et cetera, in an inpatient facility like that, but I've heard, you know, lots of conversation about it, and we've seen lots of patients come out of those facilities not really having done that well. I understand that you were there for a reason because of just the, the other concerns that you've got, and I think that was wise, but you do give up some time, and, it, and just scheduling and hospital and transfers and things, losing those five days, and then having you know, average care, you know, average therapy for a few more days does put you a little bit behind. And that, you know, for some people, David, that causes a huge problem. It did not in your case, but when you lose seven days, eight days of of time, uh, of, of recovery time, of working that knee, starting to work this fluid out, starting to address, you know, the motion, range of motion, you can really cause a longer-term problem. And when I talk to people that have, you know, are in trouble and it's six weeks post-surgery and everything's gone wrong, oftentimes they're pointing to some reason why they couldn't get going, you know, early enough and they felt like they were behind, like, like you kind of mentioned. So Yeah, if I could, like I said, even if I had to have some help, I'd 
maybe a day or two or, or you know, I was in the hospital, I think, three days, and, and well, I ended up four, and Nonweiler was pulling his hair out because he didn't like to have people stay any more than two nights. So, But the, the other place couldn't take me right away. They didn't somebody stayed an extra day or too long and and i I don't want to leave a wrong impression the place i picked was you know it wasn't a glorified nursing home it is a it was a a therapy hospital or whatever and they're very good it just i i was ready for more and yeah I, i i they're pretty structured and they're pretty busy with lots of people and i would have liked to have done more and 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 I think I could have tolerated more, mm. um, but I, it was what it was. And, you know, well, I'll learn next time. And maybe I do a couple of days there or a couple of days in the hospital. And then if I have to have another one, uh, try to schedule your machine as close to surgery as possible. Cause yeah. yeah, I knew the fact that, and then I, you know, I tried to do things in bed, but it, it, because I wasn't a fall risk, I was sort of limited to, bed or you know near because I couldn't even get out of my bed to go to the bathroom without some buzzer going off because I was a fall risk so I was sort of bed bound and and you know limited to what I could do even though I wanted to do things did they put you on a CPM machine while you were there at all no uh, none none Weiler didn't schedule that and neither did the therapy place great good good um, sometimes uh, there is a CPM uh, in the hospital I think the biggest concern is um, DVT, deep, deep vein thrombosis, uh, just yeah. to keep the, the motion going, you know, the, the knee going. Um, all right. And, and so there you are. Well, I guess you, you keep referring to, to this machine, and I do want to cover that, of course. So what, how would you describe the X10 machine? Like if someone had – you're telling a friend about it, what, what would you say? Well, I, you know, I was very, very lucky. Uh, 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 another, seemed like all of, a lot of our friends are doctors, but um, a doctor in town, Dr. Steve Gowie, who went, had your machine and I think did what you said, went two or three months and wasn't progressing. So he told my wife about it, and I did my homework. I, I got online, and I, I looked at a bunch of these casts and looked at a bunch of the videos and read all the literature on it, and, and my wife and I decided, uh, you know, one way or another we were going to get this thing. So we scheduled it. Um, and, you know, I, I, what I liked about it is the interactiveness of, with it. it. You know, it is an addition to a continuous motion machine. I, I tell people, no, it's not that. It's a lot more. And, you know, I, uh, your guy uh, – Cork, who's, who's a real character, came and set it up, and I think we spent an hour with a guy, you know, setting all the settings and getting everything right. And and but then, you know, once that, um, I, I had the booklet. The booklet was very helpful, but I started in on it, and uh, you know, bless my wife's heart, she'd have to change it, uh, you know, one time a day if I wanted to work on the left leg a little bit, but. Uh, I would at least try to do three sessions a day with it uh, on the on the, the operating leg, and then maybe one on the other leg. Um, and I time wise, I grew, but I I like the. You can kind of tell I'm a sort of a goal oriented guy. Maybe it comes with being a contractor and accomplishing building things, but you know it, it was a challenge. Okay, where are you extension wise? Where are you flexion wise? And you know I knew not to push it. But I probably, I think I had it 17 days, and and I think I got to zero extension like the first or second day. But by the 17th day, I knew Cork was coming like 8.30. I got up early that morning, and I was damned and determined to get to 130 degrees on your machine, and I did. Mm. Wow. So, but the other thing about it is the, the, the other options, the, you know, you can turn off the machine and move it yourself and i think uh i got to 108 on that the the last the, the day before uh on my own moving it uh i could see the pressures uh, and the other thing is you know with the assisted option uh, you could see the pressures it was taking and you know a lot of times maybe five minutes into the session uh, it'd take 25 or 30 whatever the number is but by the end of the 40 minutes, I mean, it wouldn't be anywhere near that number. It would be 18. So you could just see how the machine was loosening up the knee 
and even though it took more pressure at the beginning than at the end, it was it was really that was probably the true pressure on what the knee was able to you know move it. Mm-hmm. Then I like the uh, the one where you uh, press down on it and measure the strength of your leg. I like that, and, and so having the options and the video you know the screen feedback. Um, really helped me you know it never let you get down you know where you are and and talking to the you know i I had a coach and her name was trisha and she we talked every couple days and she'd ask me for my numbers and and you know we'd talk about okay do this next she gave me you know a couple hints uh you know like on the extension well when you get to the last 30 degrees start using your leg yourself and instead of just letting the machine do it move the leg up and then on the flexion the last 20 or 30 degrees again move your leg with the machine so she was uh, i think those things just helped me progress tremendously in the 17 days i had it yeah i know exactly what you're talking about too that's it's called active assist where we're trying to you know there's passive motion you've described beautifully actually the active motion where you're doing the pushing and pulling um the closed chain nature of it protects you so you're not you know if if you're just pushing up a weight machine in a gym there's a lot of pressure on that knee but you your foot is on a foot plate you're using your foot and the rollers so you're protecting the knee while actually starting to work your quads pull back with your hamstrings um and then that pump test you described pushing down pulling up pushing down um, is a, the full leg is being you know utilized so you're engaging your muscles and what you may or may not have realized is that you know there's a it, which I think you might not have because of the nerve block and the neuropathy there's a period of time where your nerves need to kind of reconnect your brain isn't really telling your body what to do as well because of the surgery and there's an adjustment period back to being in full in control of your leg and that happens to everyone that neuropathy may have just deadened that impact a little bit for you i'm guessing but but you got through that pretty well it sounds like i mean you're actively moving back to 108 you're you passively able to go to 130 you know within 17 days those are crazy numbers those are record breaking kind of numbers you mo- you know we've seen data very well respected data with from within the last 3 or 4 years you know big metadata studies that show that people don't get past, you know, 83, 85 degrees, and it could be four to six weeks. They're looking at 110 degrees at six months on average, and you, there you are at 130, you know, in 17 well, days. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you something else. You know, I, I started about, well, the last several days with the, the X10, I, I also started my going back to my physical therapist, the one that I had done before. And mm. so we started working on things, and, and you know, basically – she has three things that a Sci Fit 900 that's you know it's sort of a bike deal with arm deals, but it it's not you're not laying flat. Your leg is more like the X10. So I really love that particular version of the Sci Fit. It's like a 45 degree angle. You're pushing down with your legs and and then you know pulling with your arms. Uh, she also has another chair that you sit in that you almost like a swing set. You're swinging your legs. But she has little light weights on the on the deal you're swinging, so there is some resistance. But I'm, we're talking five or ten pound weights. Mm. And then you know she started graduating on to me what you call a total gym, which I think you know is an incline deal that you slide on. And and then you know she had some of the same, but a little different. The exercises, heel toe slide, uh, you know hamstring press, uh, lots of stuff like that. But so let's see. I can't remember exactly when Court picked it up. I want to say, what, a week ago maybe? Yeah. Well, within the last 10 days, I think, yeah. So two days ago, I got to 122 on my own, pulling my leg back. Wow. <laughs> that's active motion. That's that's all you, right? That's, that's all huge. me. That's really great. Yeah. She was, she was amazed, and so was Dr. Nunwiler's assistant. Now, I didn't do quite as well with her. She had me try it. I think I learned when you're laying flat on your back, it's harder to pull your knee that degree as you can when you're laying on like a 45-degree cushion that 
right. the therapist has me on. And at least that's my theory because I only got to 108 with her and I was disappointed. But I really did get to 122 with the therapist without her assisting me. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, so that tells was, you that you're back. And I know that's, you know, your goal is, in fact, my left leg will only do 120. So uh, I, I'm happy, but I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to, con- I, I do the stretching things several times a day now. I'm, I'm still using a walker because I'm not totally comfortable with my balance on my own, but I'm getting there. I've tried, you know, walking across the room with a cane the other day. That went well. And like today, I went to my walker with four wheels on it instead of the walker with two wheels and the little tennis balls. So um, I'm, I'm trying and I, you know, I walk 20 minutes a couple times a day and then I'm doing her therapy three times a week for an hour. So I, uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm glad I did it, I'm, and I, but I'm even more glad I found the X10. Wow. And so tell me this. Thank you. Um, but tell me this on the um, on the the walker and the balance. Is this, do you think, a function of the neuropathy? Would you say? Yeah, the totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, and I'm I'm you know what had happened. My balance got a lot worse uh, with the knee, and I. Um, because I, I it, it was the pain. Here I am trying to balance with both legs, and I got one leg that if I put weight on it, it hurts. Right. And so it's hard to balance that way, and now that pain's gone. And so now I'm back just dealing with the neuropathy, and, and I can deal with that. I, in fact, I'm back doing some foot circles that I did learn with my back operation. And I don't think I can recover the the nerves, but I, I'm trying to do things that'll help my balance. Um, cause I had a nerve study done about three weeks before the knee surgery. Cause I had a pain that I couldn't describe that I thought was caused by the knee. And it started just below my shin and went down into my, uh, almost the top of my foot. And fortunately my doctor's smarter than I am. He said, no, that's something else. And so in the middle of all this, I found out that the only disc or the only joint in my back that wasn't fixed by various other things the uh, l5 s1 joint had a bulging disc so about two weeks before my knee surgery i had a shot for that and sure enough that he got he found the nerve that caused that pain as i'm listening to this um it's it's but the knee uh, you know the the nerve study i'd always maybe amateur thought okay peripheral means okay your your feet are going to be a little difficult your fingers you know my fingers are okay but they're not perfect mm-hmm. i just assumed the word peripheral meant peripheral but knee study showed that it's gone into both the tibial and the peroneal nerve mm. so mm. anyway that you, you've navigated so much i i mean you breezed through the the <clears throat> bladder catheter like it was uh, just a little annoyance that's a big deal that's completely I know, uh, I know of lots of knee patients that that's had to happen. All kinds of other things. I know knee patients have lost their voice for for three months, you know, inexplicably. Mm. I mean, funny things happen when you're under anesthesia. You're on nerve blocks. You're taking opioids, although you didn't need that as much. It sounds like, but you breeze through so many different factors that you've mentioned in this talk, um, and yet you seem to be emerging on the other end of this. Uh, I think you mentioned you're going to be driving soon again. Yeah, I, uh, it, it rained yesterday in the day here, but I'll I'll start driving. I, I got in the car the other day, just you know, I drove it back twenty feet and forward twenty feet just to see if I could do it. And my wife mm-hmm. said, "Don't hit the house." And... <laughs> um, tell me this: what what is the the prescription for you for the neuropathy? Meaning, uh, is it motion, motion, keep moving, keep using the the muscles? What what is the what are you supposed to be I doing to deal with it? I don't think there's any. I, you know, males, guys uh, said that, and, and I've got a nerve, my, the neurosurgeon that did my back is a guy I see. I, I used to have a neurologist, but he retired. But I don't, I, I don't think there's anything I can do about it. Just be careful is, is all I can mm-hmm. do. And it's, it's gradual. Um, 
I will tell you that the, the wonderful guy in, in Mayo's, his famous words to me were, well, more than likely you won't end up in a wheelchair. Mm. <laughs> How's wow. that for bedside manner? Right, right. You know, trying to inspire uh, you. But, you know, I mean, he was being realistic. And, and, and don't get me wrong. It, there's no place better to go than Mayo's. And I'm yeah. lucky. Yeah. Um, the guy that wrote the book on Mayo's is called Peter, Dr. Peter Dick, D-Y-C-K. And my case manager was his son. Wow. And they they put me through more tests than in fact I'll you go have to cut this, but I'll tell you one of them. They got me naked in a room, they painted me pink, and I mean literally from head to toe. Wow. Pink paint, put me in essentially a convection oven at four hundred and fifty degrees and what didn't turn green is where my nerves were dead. Wow. Now, you know, who in the hell thinks up a test like that? No. <laughs> that <laughs> but is But, you know, it is what it is. I've studied neuropathy. I, You know, there may be hope someday with stem cells, but they're not there yet. Uh, mm-hmm. They're You know, they're working on back stuff and paraplegics, and they're having some success. But, um, in fact, I, you know, they're even trying some of that on knees, but I don't think it, it's certainly not in lieu of a knee replacement. But, uh you know, I, maybe someday, but, you know, probably not in my lifetime, but I, I think eventually they'll be able to regenerate nerves. But right now, I, I don't think uh, there, there's any, and I don't think you can reverse this, but the same guy, Dr. Gow, he said, hey, I know a place in town that stimulates, but everybody says that, but I, what I know is you can't stimulate things that are dead, but mm-hmm. I may go try it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right on the stem cells, stem cells for knees. It's hit and miss. I think more misses than hits, uh, just from my observation. Uh, but there are people that speak very, very highly of them, the way they've worked for, for them. I think that there's gene editing out there that is, if you've read anything about CRISPR and some of that technology, it's fascinating. And that, that could play a role for the next generations. But I, I think you're right. I think we're not going to see all the benefits, you know, at least in that, in that regard. It's great to hear where you've come, uh, going through the neuropathy side of this equation. Your recovery has been brilliant, and um, I guess I'm just I'm excited about what happens over the next few months, really, because you've got you're putting this behind you. Six weeks later, a great report. You're putting you're putting from the doctor. You're putting, you know, you're you're on to the next through your real life again. I guess I'm trying to stumble through. And no, and I, I couldn't, you know, I, I was motivated and I had other good help, but and I think Nonweiler did a great job, but yeah. I don't Sounds think like I'd it. be where I am without the three weeks with your machine, PJ. So thank right. you. And I've, thank uh, you. I, I, I'm going to be a good advocate. I know that's not what this podcast is about. You can cut this part, but I, anybody that asks, I'm going to tell them they need to, if you're going to do this surgery, the full, full knee replacement, you need to think long and hard about getting this machine. Right. No, I'm not cutting that. I'm not cutting that at all. Are you kidding? I'm keeping that in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dr. Justin Trosclair, host of two-time podcast awards nominated A Doctor's Perspective podcast. I interview doctors in and out of my profession about their specialties and the occasional non-doctor special guests. But we also go behind the curtain and see what's working for their marketing overcoming struggles, practical knowledge, book choices, and relationship advice. Join me on any podcast app on your phone or visit a doctorsperspective.net for the show notes pages and free resources. I want you to have an abundant home life as well as a thriving practice. So come on, take a listen. To learn more, visit x10therapy.com, 1-855-910-5633. Just a reminder, it's a huge help if you subscribe to, rate, and review our podcast. It helps people find us. X10, back to full strength.